Good morning, Celebration Church. Are you ready to praise the Lord this morning? Come on, put your hands together.
went out when death had claimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history and there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake
church, if you're comfortable with it, I'm just going to speak a blessing over you in the name of Jesus. If you'll just raise your hands. Father, these are your people, the sheep of your pasture. Father, they have come into your presence with an expectation. God, that you will honor your word, that they will not come into your presence the same way. They won't leave the same way they came. People of God, I speak to the giants in your life. We do not come at them with sword and spear, but at the name of the Lord our God. I speak in the name of Jesus that your strength will equal the number of your days, that you will be supernaturally empowered for the assignment God has on your life, that it will not be by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I bless you, I praise you, Jesus. We exalt you and lift you up in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Woo! I gotta tell ya, I usually sit in the back, kind of towards the media booth, because that's where my family likes to sit. But when I sit on the front and you guys start singing, I'm telling you, this is what my hair does. Because you guys are so loud and I love it. I love it. Well, I just want to welcome you to Celebration Church and say it's an honor to be here with you guys. Why don't you take a minute and say hi to the folks around you. Tell them you're glad they came to church this morning. Shake two or three hands. You know what? I've been on the job all of about 35 seconds, and I already forgot something. I forgot to thank the worship team. Can we thank the worship team for an incredible job? Ma'am. I tell you, they're already going to take points off when they score me at the end of the day. Well, for those of you who I've not had a chance to meet yet, my name is Sarah Stevens, and I'm the director of ministries here at Celebration. And our senior pastor, Pastor Frankie Mazapika, is at another church here in the Houston area, and he'll be back next week. So if you're visiting with us, we'd love to have you back next week, and he'd love to see you and get to minister to you. And if you are visiting with us, we have a special gift just for you. In the lobby, there's a green table, and it says new guest. And if you're a new guest, we have a gift. It's a $15 Visa card. Maybe you've been saving up to buy that butter at the grocery store, you know. <laughs> Maybe there's some stuff in your Amazon cart you've been waiting to pull the trigger on. Maybe you'd like a gallon of gas. I don't know. Maybe you'd like to have lunch. But there's a $15 Visa card that just says, hey, thanks for checking us out. You could have been anywhere on this Sunday morning, and we're glad that you're here. So just go out to the main lobby, and on the right, you can get that. And I have a question, are there any life group leaders in the house this morning? Anybody who leads a life group for Celebration Church? It's okay to raise your hand. I'm not going to bring you on stage. I'm not going to ask you to lead another life group. All right. Oh, Sandy Murphy, come on up. So let me give this to one of our life group leaders at Celebration. Thank you. So life groups at Celebration, we want you to sit with people who sit with Jesus. We want you to have community, and like the proverb says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another's countenance, and that's how we do that in our life groups. And so life groups are about to kick off. If you'd like to join one, if you'd like to get more information about them, you can just snap that QR code, open up your camera, or you can stop at that same table in the lobby, and they'll tell you all of the options that are out there and help you get connected. But don't live life alone. Jesus was the son of God, and he still had community with 12 men who were chasing the same things he was. So if Jesus needed community, I'm pretty sure we're going to need community. And so I challenge you to be a part of a life group or to lead a life group. Well, church, if you are a visitor again, don't reach for your wallet or your purse. This is when our church family practices a biblical principle in the realm of our tithes and our offerings. Quick question. This is an ADD moment. Does anybody else always hear the same car? 
I'm telling you, I feel like he's a part of our service. <laughs> like, I miss him when I don't hear his little car at whatever time I hear it. I think, oh, I hope he's doing all right. You know, oh, he's running late for work. You know, there's a mama somewhere praying that he gets a muffler. You know, I don't know. <laughs> but I always hear him. God bless him. So uh, with that said, I got off track there. Again, more points off, you know. We are going to take up our tithes and offerings, and I just want to encourage you with the scripture. It's found in Psalm 127, verse 1. It says, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects the city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. I love this verse as I go into a new year because I have big goals, big expectations. My husband and I, we are focused on a few things with regards to our finances and with regards to our home, with regards to our health, with regards to our marriage and our parenting. But here's the reality. Unless the Lord builds it, we are laboring in vain. And I want to encourage you, church, make your tithes and offerings, your house of finances, put it before the Lord first. Or you're going to find in December, you've worked and you've sweated through your clothes and you don't have very much to show for it because he has not built your house today. So I want to challenge you with that, grow your faith with that, and let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that every man and woman here as they build your house, you are building their house. God, I thank you that centuries are not protecting them, but Father, angels of the living God are protecting them. Father, I thank you that your word says you rebuke the devourer for our sakes. And so Father, honor your word in their lives. As they build your house, as they give their first fruits to you, Father, let them see it return to them in the area of their life where they need it most. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I'm going to welcome our online campus right now and just say we are so excited that you are here. You could be tuning in and doing anything right now. You could be watching the news and getting depressed, or you could be doing any number of things, eating bonbons, I don't know, but you chose the house of God. And we're glad you're here and you're joining us remotely. And I want to challenge you, lean into what the Lord has for you. Press into what he wants to speak into your life today. Church, can you welcome the online campus this morning? They're excited that you're here. Well, I'm going to open this bottle of water really quick. Thank you for playing piano through that moment. It was a little stressful. So, <laughs> well, church, um, I just want to jump into the word with you guys this morning and share something that I know the Lord is going to bless you with. Um, Todd and I just celebrated 19 years of marriage on Tuesday. Yes. And he told me it doesn't feel a day over 40, you know? But no, we, we are truly blessed, and I'm very thankful for my husband. And we have two amazing children. We have a daughter who's 16 and a son who's 14. And before we had children, we had a lot of theories about parenting, you know, we were going to raise hypothetical children perfectly, right? And then the Lord blesses you with children, and your theories just go right out the door. Can anybody testify to that? But your prayer life rises exponentially, right? So, but we are just extremely blessed. And one of the things that we like to do as a family is we are road trip people. Like, why fly there when you can spend six or seven days getting there, right? It's the Texas way. That is why there are buckies every hundred miles and why you hold it till you get there. It is the way. Walk in it. So we are just road trip people. And we were going to Colorado to see the leaves turn last fall. You know, we wanted to see some place with hills, and we wanted to see a tree other than a pine tree. So we treated ourselves to this trip. Well, if you've ever driven in the mountains, they have these things called passes that they have cut through. 
where the pastor's job is to get you from point A to point B as safely and as efficiently as possible, right? So we rented, we flew into Denver. This was a big treat. You know, we flew. We didn't spring for luggage, but we did fly. And we rent this car. We get a Jeep 4x4, you know, so we're going to be able to handle anything that Colorado tackles or throws at us. And we're on this pass on our way to or from Aspen. I can't remember now. And there was gridlock. There was cars in front of us, cars beside us, cars behind us, and there was no alternate route. Like, have you ever been on one of those mountain passes? Like, you're behind the goats. The goats are waiting because they can't even climb the mountain that you're trying to get through. So we're sitting there, and I'm thinking to myself, no big deal. You know, I probably don't have to use the bathroom for another 45 minutes. We're going to be fine, right? And all of a sudden, this freak snowstorm comes out of nowhere. And so we are sitting on this mountain pass, and the snow starts blowing. At first, it's beautiful, and we're excited, right? We didn't pay extra for that. We were there for the leaves, and the snow was like a bonus. But then we feel our car, which is parked, start to slide backwards because the snow has melted on that hot asphalt, refrozen, and now my tires are sliding backwards. So we think to ourselves, no problem. We got the 4 by 4 Jeep here. Let's pup, you know, put this puppy in gear and see what it can do. And Todd cannot get that four-wheel drive to engage. He's like, Sarah, look in the owner's manual. I tear the cellophane off the owner's manual. The car had seven miles on it, y'all. Brand new car. I'm looking. I have never used a glossary outside of the fourth grade until that moment. I go to the glossary. I'm like, four-wheel drive. Todd's like, Sarah, it's a major function of the vehicle. You should be able to see it in the index. He's very calm, very calm under pressure, right? We work and we work at it. Can't get the thing to engage. Thankfully, thankfully, traffic broke, and we were able to keep moving and not lose our grip and slide back any further. (laughs) That story reminds me that there is one route from where you are today to where God wants to take you. There is one pass, one cut through, and that is the renewing of your mind. A lot of believers get very frustrated because they love God, they serve God, they're in his house, but their tires keep sliding backwards and they're stuck, not because of lack of love or desire, but because God has told us in his word, there is one way to get from A to B, and that is through the renewing of your mind. And so I want to share with you today how we renew our minds and the signs of a renewed mind. You know, when you read the scripture, Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and he wrote to the church in Rome about renewing their mind in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. He wrote to the church in the book of Colossians, in Colossians 3, and told them that they used to walk in their old ways, but God was making them into an image of himself, and they had to renew their minds. First Peter tells us, be sober-minded. Second Peter says that grace and peace will be multiplied to you through a knowledge of God your Savior. So here's my point. If the Holy Spirit through the apostles encouraged the early church that they had to get their minds renewed, how much more does the church in 2023 need to have their minds renewed? These guys were saved, they loved Jesus, they had pretty good pastors. I mean, Peter and Paul, that's a pretty good pastor. We're sitting here in 2023 with the word of God and excellent pastors, but if your mind's not renewed, you're not moving forward. And I don't want that to be the case for any of us. So I could preach out of a hundred scriptures. I'm going to preach out of one because there's no such thing as a bad short sermon. And so we are going to be in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And I'm going to just read the word. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, 
to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable and pleasing to God. This is your act of reasonable worship. And do not be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. Now, guys, here's where I'm at. I want the last part of that verse. I want to be in the center of God's will in every single decision I make. My goal for 2023 is not to make the same mistakes I made in 2022. And if I lose 10 pounds, hallelujah. But the first one (laughs) is not to make the same mistakes. That's what I think we all want. But you'll notice there's two check boxes before you get to that third. You cannot test and approve what God's will is until, number one, you present yourself as a living sacrifice. And what that simply means is that you worship God every day in the decisions you make, in the choices and the words that come out of your mouth, in the integrity and the way that you choose to conduct yourself, you see as a sacrifice. When you have every right to respond one way, you choose to lay it on the altar and sacrifice and respond the way God would have you respond. The reality is that God is not trying to make you and I better people. I have met Sarah 2.0, and she's not that impressive. She can eat carbs, but that's it, right? That's it. Jesus is trying to make you more and more like himself, and that requires a living sacrifice. The second part is the one we're going to camp on today, and that's having a renewed mind. Once you and I check those two boxes, we're able to test and approve what God's perfect, pleasing will is. So I want to kind of go over four signs of a renewed mind. And then as you're listening to the word of the Lord today, I'm going to just ask the Holy Spirit to kind of give you a little nudge. So wives, you don't need to nudge your husbands. I've already asked the Holy Spirit to do it, right? And just ask him, say, Lord, search me and know me. You know my innermost thoughts. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. So, Father, as we hear the signs of a renewed mind, minister to your people and let them hear your still, small voice. So that's my prayer for you today. So the first sign of a renewed mind is that a renewed mind is not self-centered, but God-centered. So a self-centered mind sounds like this. I think, I feel, I want. And that is the grid that the self-centered mind makes all of its decisions on. I just think, I want, and I feel. Now, as the people of God, when we have a God-centered mind, a renewed mind, we ask these questions. What does God think? What does God want? How does God feel? It's a completely different paradigm. And you find out how God thinks, what he feels, and what he wants from his word. You are renewed in your mind through the word of God. So the word was given to us. I love it that Jesus says in John 6, he says, The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. The psalmist says, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The writers of Hebrews says that the word of God is living, it is active, it is sharper than a double-edged sword, being able to even divide the intents and the thoughts of a heart. Your kids ever tell you something? Oh, I just did it because, but you know their motive was a little different. That's how powerful the word of God is. It can divide even your motive from your thought, your thought from your action. And you and I answer those questions. What does God want? What does he feel? And what does he think? By going to that source, it unifies us as the body of Christ. And a renewing mind is God-centered. 
There's a story about this young woman. She lived in the UK. She was 17 years old. And out of nowhere, she just collapsed at her place where she was working her little 17-year-old job. She was rushed to the hospital. Doctors are scrambling to find out what is wrong with this perfectly appearing like a perfectly healthy young woman of 17. She comes to, and they start interviewing her. They start looking at her blood work. And she tells the doctors that she has eaten absolutely nothing but chicken nuggets for the last 15 years. She didn't eat a fruit. She didn't eat a vegetable. She would occasionally slip in a french fry. But she has subsisted on chicken nuggets for 15 years. First thing that came to my mind, this is why Chick-fil-A needs to expand to the UK, because I don't think that would happen if they had some variety of chicken nuggets, but the second thought I had was doctors diagnosed her with anemia, and they started giving her intravenous vitamins and minerals right away. She was on the verge of a complete meltdown physically because she had lived only on chicken nuggets. Here's the reality. There are a lot of men and women of God who are living on spiritual chicken nuggets. And when the storm comes, out of the blue, they collapse. And they don't know why or what's going on. And when the good physician, the great physician gets to them, he realizes they don't have the minerals and the nutrition that they need to withstand that storm because they just haven't eaten anything from the word of God in a long, long time. Jesus said this to Satan himself when he was tempted in the wilderness. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You, amen. If you guys would clap an amen, I could sip more water. That'd be a blessing. Thank you. I'm trying, part of my New Year's is I'm trying to drink more water. I didn't realize my body would like get addicted to it. Now I got to drink water all the time. It's crazy. You were designed to live from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And when you don't partake of it, it may take a minute, but eventually you'll feel yourself weaker and weaker and weaker. And on the outside, you'll look like a completely normal person going through all the motions, but on the inside, you're severely malnourished. And that's not God's will for you. So a renewing mind is God-centered, and we get God-centered by getting in his word. The second sign of a renewing mind is that it's humble. It doesn't seek to get. It seeks to give. Jesus said this about himself in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25 and 28. It says, Jesus called them together. These are the disciples. He said, you know the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be a servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve, not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the creator of the universe in whom all things are held together. And he came to the earth not as a king, but as a servant. And he challenges his disciples that they will have to do the same. The renewing mind is humble. You know, there's a principle in leadership called leading from the second chair. And at Celebration Church, Part of my job description is that I'm the chief of staff, which basically means I serve every single staff person and make them as successful as possible. I advocate for them. But Margaret Thatcher had this really, really good quote. She was a prime minister in the UK. And she said, if you have to tell people you're in charge or a lady, chances are you're neither. (laughs) 
That's leadership from the second chair. Jesus modeled leading from the second chair. In John 6, or John 5, 19, he said, I only do that which I see the Father doing. Jesus was in the first, God was in the first chair, Jesus was in the second. In Philippians 2, 5, it says that he made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant. Jesus led from the second chair, and so will so many of I, so many of us. So Dwight Moody was a evangelist during the Civil War. He founded the YMCA, which many of us probably joined two weeks ago <laughs> and haven't been back. <laughs> he started the Moody Bible Institute, amazing man of God, a revivalist. And he had this really incredible quote. He said, when I was a young man, I used to think that God had his gifts arranged on the shelves that were tallest. But I've learned the opposite. The best gifts are on the bottom shelves, and you don't reach up for them. You stoop down for them. <laughs> the renewing mind is a humble mind. The third sign of a renewed mind is that a renewed mind is a sound mind. 2 Timothy 2.17 says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a... You know it. So a sound mind is not given to extremes. You know, you're not devoid of reality. You're not living in some fantasy land. You know, hypothetically speaking... I've heard conversations that go like this. I'm believing God for favor when I take that test. And I think to myself, amen, you are the head and not the tail. You are blessed and highly favored. But have you cracked a textbook, right? <laughs> Study to show thyself approved, young man. <laughs> you know, a sound mind understands the reality of the situation, understands the responsibilities of the situation. So you're not in some fairy tale, but you're not a gray cloud looking for a place to rain either. Have you ever met anyone that's like an Eeyore? <laughs> like you remember that character from Pooh, Eeyore? I guess I'll just go find my tail. You know, man, those people are like, suck the energy right out of you, right? Oh my gosh, the weather outside's beautiful. I think that means the pollen's coming. My nose is going to get so stuffy. Okay, I'm the only person who has these conversations with people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, here's the meme. They call it a first world problem. You guys have heard of that before? Oh my gosh, my car won't start. It's so frustrating. And I'm like, praise God you have a car. First world problem, right? So there's a soundness to your mind that is not given to extremes. You're not in fantasy land, and you're not a rain cloud looking for a place to just drop. But there is a truth that you are fastened to, that irrespective of the circumstances that you are encountering, you know the character of our God, you have experienced the provision of our God, and you have the ability to declare the truth of God over that situation so that while it may not change the way you want it to change, you will see it through to the end. That is a sound mind. You know, um, I was thinking about this principle. It's really difficult. I do a lot of women's ministry <laughs> because I happen to be one. I don't know if anybody noticed, but anyway... And with women, it's very difficult sometimes because our feelings are so real. And that's the reality. Feelings are incredibly real. They're just terrible coaches. <laughs> True. Your feelings are very, very real and very, very acute. But we are not leaning into our feelings when we make decisions we're leaning into the truth of God's word. I'll be honest with you, I don't feel like fixing my family dinner most nights, right? 
but I know that I can serve them and to love them in that way. So I rise above how I feel and do the action. And I'll tell you something. Your feelings will not come before the action, but your actions will dictate the feelings that come. So that, had to, that was a revelation for me because I never feel like exercising. But when I start exercising, the excitement about exercising comes after the fact, right? The enemy will have you in a loop when it comes to your mind and says, if you'll just wait a little bit, you'll feel like X, Y, Z. And that is a lie from the pit of hell. The just walk by faith, which means you step out into what you're supposed to do before you feel like doing it. And that is a sign of a renewed mind. So the last sign of a renewed mind is that it's alert. When Todd and I were first married, I had a little five-speed Toyota Solara, like a little two-door Toyota Solara. You guys remember those? First of all, let's just have like an age check. Who here can actually drive a five-speed car? You are my people. Can you write in cursive too? I don't. Praise God. We're taking it by force, church. <laughs> we had this little five-speed car, and we drove it till we actually ended up giving it away because you cannot put a Toyota in the ground. I tell you what, you can just drive that thing. The body will fall apart before the engine does. Funny story, I was turning on Research Forest, and Avery was sitting in the front seat. Her little door flew open. I said, that's why we wear seatbelt sugar, you know. <laughs> but it's paid for and we're going to keep driving it, amen. So we had this little five-speed car and our son was young, super young. He was maybe eight. And sometimes I would park it in the driveway. Our driveway had like maybe a 1% incline. It was very, 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 very subtle. And I would say, hey, Owen, let me see how big your muscles are why don't you see if you can push mommy's car? And I'd pop that car in neutral, and that eight-year-old, mm, and that car would roll. You guys remember that? You have a five-speed? Put that thing in neutral, and you can run it around the block, do whatever. My eight-year-old felt like Superman. He was like, let me know if you need anything else, Mom, you know? <laughs> Your minds are like a five-speed car, and the enemy wakes up every day and his job and his goal is to sow enough thoughts in your mind so he can push you in any direction other than in the direction of Jesus Christ. But scripture says, set your mind. You put it in gear. And that car is not going to move once it's in gear. You try to push a car in gear and what you're going to get is a hernia, right? You can't stop the enemy from trying to sow thoughts in your mind. He's going to try to do it all day, every day. But you can give him a lot less to work with if you will put it in gear. Scripture says, it says here, Romans 8, 5, those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. You set it. 1 Peter 1.13, therefore their minds are alert and fully sober. Set your hope and grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. Colossians 3.2, set your minds on things above and not earthly things. You cannot be passive in your thought life. You have to be set in your thought life. Hell knows the scriptures as well as heaven. And every demon in hell knows Proverbs 25, 7, which says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So the fight is on because the enemy knows that if he can get you to think about, he's got a much better shot at getting you to do it because sin is conceived in the mind and then gives birth to death. So a mind that is being renewed, you wake up in the morning and you determine that I will, like Philippians says, think on these things. Whatsoever things are true, 
They are honest, they are just, they are pure, and they are lovely. I will think on those things. Now, does that keep the demons trying to nibble at my toes and sow things into my life? No. But that's why 1 Corinthians 10 says you take that thought captive and you bring it under the lordship of Jesus Christ. So what does this look like in like real life for Sarah? Well, here's how it sounds in my mind. I will be getting ready for the day. And the enemy will come to me with a thought. And he'll say something to the effect of, um, you know, Sarah, I just don't think that you and Todd are going to be able to send your kids to college. I just don't think the money's there and it's going to be a long, hard road and your kids are going to have to borrow a lot of money and they're going to go into debt and maybe you should just kind of pare back your dreams a little bit. That's a real thought that the enemy injects into my mind. This is how I take it captive. I say, Lord Jesus, Father, I thank you that Avery and Owen are your workmanship. They are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which you have prepared in advance for them to do, Ephesians 4. And I thank you that preparing them in advance means that you are making a way for them to get the education they need to walk in what you have for them. So, Father, I don't know how it's coming. I don't know how you're going to do it. I know that I have built your house, and you tell me in Habakkuk, you will build my house. So today, I will serve you, I will trust you, I will remain in covenant with you, and I will trust you to keep your word to me, because you're not a man that you should lie. Every time the enemy comes to me and I turn it around and I start thanking God for his character, I start speaking the word of God over the situation, you will find hell will stop bothering you or they will bother you less and less because the last thing they want to do is give glory to God. And I'll let you in on another secret. Jesus modeled this for us in the wilderness. Two sinless people had conversations with Satan, Eve and Jesus. And Eve did well. She started with the word of God because the enemy came to her and said, have you considered this fruit? And she said, we shall not touch it or we shall die. And then the enemy came back to her and said, you'll surely not die. God knows that once you have it, you'll be like him knowing good and evil, Genesis 3. And then the scripture says when she considered the fruit, that it was pleasing to the eye and could make them wise, She took and she ate. So the enemy came to her with a thought. She started with the word of God. And then she went back into her logic and she considered and thought and processed it on her own. And she fell. Friend, if you go down that road, the enemy will have you like you have breakfast every day. Because your thoughts and your logic are no match for the living word of God. Now you go to the wilderness... And the enemy comes to Jesus. And Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. And he said, if you are hungry, turn these bread, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then Satan goes, okay, so he knows the Bible. And so he says, well, it is also written that he should give his angels charge over you. Throw yourself from the top of this mount down. And Jesus comes back to him with the word and says, you shall also not tempt the Lord your God. And back and forth, they volley, they volley, they volley, until eventually Satan gives up and leaves because he can't stand to hear the word of God. The father of lies cannot stand in the truth. That's the reality. So he can stand in the presence of God all day. He has no problem accusing us before the Father. He has no problem having a conversation with Jesus in the wilderness. He has no qualms about coming to you in your thought life. But he will hit the road, Jack, when you start speaking the truth back to him and you answer his lies with it. And that's the last test of renewing mind. It is alert and it is active. Why don't you stand with me, church? And prayer partners, if you can go ahead and kind of start making your way to the front. There is a story in the book of Numbers. It's Numbers chapter 14. 
and it's a haunting verse. Numbers chapter 14, verse 2. This is right after the 12 spies have gone to scope out the promised land that God has promised them. And you guys probably know this story. They came back with this huge evidence that this land was good, that it was flowing with milk and honey. But they saw the giants in the land, and it made them very, very scared. And they convinced themselves they could not possess it. In Numbers 14, I think it's verse 2, they start lamenting to Moses. And they said, oh, that we should have died in Egypt. These children of God had the visible presence of God in a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. They had the demonstration of miracles. They had seen the Red Sea split. They had manna from heaven. They had the empirical evidence that the land was good. And they had the word of God because Genesis 15, the promise to Abraham and your descendants is that you will possess this land. They had all of that. But they got right up to what God had for them, but could not enter into it because their mindset was Egypt. Oh, that we had died in Egypt. Church, I want to encourage you. You can have the presence of the Holy Spirit. You can experience the miraculous in your life. You can have the written word of God, and you can have incredible leadership in a church. They had incredible leaders in Moses. We have an incredible pastor, an incredible church. But if your mind has not been transformed and you're still thinking about Egypt, you will get right up to what God has for you, but you won't possess it. And that is not God's will for anyone in this room or in the sound of my voice. And so today, I just want to close with a prayer, asking the Lord to speak to you and to show you if there's any area of your mind that needs to be transformed. And if you want to take the hand of a prayer partner today, you have a need in your physical body, you need a physical healing, they will pray for you. They believe in healing. We can see God do that today. But if you want to link your faith with some of their faith and say, hey, I feel myself slipping back. I need to engage this thing in four-wheel drive. I am stuck on a pass between where I'm at and where God's taking me, and I just want to borrow a little bit of your faith. I want to borrow a little bit of your strength, and I want you to believe God for me and with me in this moment. Our prayer partners are here to do that. So let me just pray for you, and then the altars are open. Come take the hand of someone who can believe God with you. And then when you're ready, we're going to sing this song maybe one time through, and then you can dismiss yourself. I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your people. Father, I thank you that your word is true, that it will not return void in the name of Jesus. Like the rain falls to the earth and accomplishes why it was sent to make things bud and flourish, Father, the word of God will fall in their lives and accomplish the purpose for which you set it. Areas of their life will be fruitful now in the name of Jesus. Father, I thank you that the Holy Spirit is going to teach them all things. He is going to bring all things to their remembrance like Jesus promised us he would do. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're going to enable them to take thoughts captive, that they're going to praise you in faith for the things that they don't see yet as though they were in Jesus' name. Father, I speak hope and healing over marriages, that words would be said in love and not anger in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you right now that you are setting people free from thought patterns that have plagued them from the day they were born. God, I bind spirits right now that are unclean in the name of Jesus. I bind a spirit of jealousy. You have no place on the people of God. I bind in the name of Jesus fear. God has not given his people a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I bind anxiety in the name of Jesus. You will keep him in perfect peace whose heart is set on you. I speak peace to the people of God right now in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you. I thank you for what you are doing in your people. And we worship you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.